Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> hey, 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 don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila. Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click. Get flexible payment options. Then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to thenextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. It's hard to believe that we've been having in-depth weekly conversations about movies since 2011. So many great conversations over the years about so many great movies. All that said, producing this show week after week requires a ton of work behind the scenes. Becoming a Next Real member gives you access to all sorts of additional and exclusive content. Plus, you're helping us keep the lights on. Just head to thenextreel.com slash membership, where you can learn more about becoming a member, which costs a measly $5 a month, practically the same as one fancy coffee drink. And you get so much more. Every month, we record a bonus episode exclusively for members. Those episodes cover movies from whatever series we're covering at the moment or add to previous series. Some movies we've covered that only members get to hear us discuss include The Blues Brothers, The Russia House, Naked Lunch, Independence Day, The Hot Rock, and Relic, the better one. Plus, members get to vote on what we're going to discuss for those episodes. We also record additional pre- and post-show content in regular episodes that only members get to hear. Like conversations about similarly themed movies. And answering listener questions from our live member chat. Speaking of our live member chat, we record almost all of our episodes in Discord, where members can chat right along with us live. Members get access to other members-only channels in our Discord community as well. On top of all that, members get all episodes a full week earlier than everyone else in a private Next Reel feed just for them that includes all the shows in the Next Reel family. The Next Reel, the film board, movies we like, sitting in the dark, and more new projects on the way. To top it all off, members don't have to listen to ads. We've already eliminated those annoying, dynamically inserted ads that, let's face it, we all hate it. We are listening to you. We love podcasting for a living, and those ads help to pay the bills. Now, we're counting on you, dear listener. We promise we aren't going back to those terrible, dynamically inserted ads that don't relate to us at all. All we ask is that you consider supporting the Next Real family of podcasts with a membership. Again, it's $5 per month or $55 per year. Just head to thenextreel.com slash membership. Thenextreel.com slash membership. Get your access to early ad-free episodes with bonus content, member bonus episodes, and access to member channels and live streams in Discord by signing up today. Welcome to Movies We Like, part of the True Story FM Entertainment Podcast Network. I'm Andy Nelson, and that over there is Pete Wright. I'm Pete Wright. On today's episode, we have invited cinematographer Eric Messerschmidt to talk about Roman Polanski's Chinatown, a movie he likes. Eric, welcome to the show. Hi, guys. Eric. We are thrilled to have you joining us. Uh, 
thrilled to talk to you and to talk about this particular movie, which is uh, has long been one of my favorites. So I'm very much looking forward to digging in. But before we do, let's talk a little bit about you. Uh oh. <laughs> uh, j- jumping all the way back to the start, um, how did you decide, you know, cinematography? I think that's where I want to to live. I had no other options. No, I, um, <laughs> I, uh, I, you know, I was I was a theater geek in, in high school. I was a terrible athlete and um, I, I loved science. I loved math. I loved making stuff. I loved taking things apart. And, uh, but I also, you know, I liked art and photography and, and music. And, um, I, you know, I was, I was involved in the theater and I, I liked the team aspect of the theater. You know, I liked the kind of your, your group of creative people all working towards one goal. And, and I, you know, I, I, I got into that. I, I enjoyed that process. And, you know, I found compatriots in that world. But then I realized that the problem with working in the theater and being in the theater is you're in the theater all the time. You know, you're in a dark room your entire life. And that freaked me out. So I started to look for that experience in other places. And I, I found it in the movie business. You know, I found it in in the movie set. So to be honest, it was like the the thing that initially attracted me to the job of the job of being, you know, on movies was was the set experience and the kind of camaraderie of the set experience. And as I learned more about what cinematographers did and, and, um, and, and what the, you know, the creative role of the cinematographer was, it, it became really obvious that it, it fell in line with all of my interests. You know, it was technical, you know, it required logistical competence, but it was also, you know, enormously creative and it, it, um, and, and, and also was a, you know, collaborative thing. So it's, it just kind of, it felt very, very natural for me. So you didn't go in to the movie business like your your initial experience on set was not behind the camera. Uh, no, it was. I mean, okay. I was not as a camera, not as a not as a camera person per se. I mean, I wasn't. It wasn't like I I I stepped out of film school and and was a cinematographer. You know, I I matriculated. I was I I went to film school and uh, I, you know I was one of those overly ambitious and you know uh, excited students. Um, and I I started to work. I started to work as a you know as production assistant as a as a grip as an electrician on low budget movies. You know these were not big movies. <laughs> you know, low budget horror films, you know, uh, independent dramas. And I, you know, I went to school in Boston where at the time, anyway, there was a lot of that. There was a lot of opportunity for 20 year old kids, um, who, who were overjoyed, uh, making a hundred dollars a day to carry sandbags, you know? So it was, that was, you know, that was kind of my entry. And then I, you know, I moved to LA and, and, and slowly, very slowly worked my way up. Well, it's definitely a process like, you know, climbing the rungs of the ladder as it were. And, I mean, you're right. There is a very strong technical aspect to the world of uh, cinematography, like the cameras, just the technology that goes into all of the parts of the cameras and the lenses. And especially with the, you know, the evolution, I mean, pretty much through your career in film of the digital camera and, and like how that really kind of integrated into the system. I mean, finding the balance between the technology in the system and the creativity like do you find the draw to it because it is this fascinating blend of the two and the way you get to kind of dabble in you know all of the the technology that goes into what's inside a lens and and the f-stops and everything but also how that actually ends up reflecting into the captured image i think the older i get the more attracted i am to the idea of becoming a luddite to be honest you know it's sort of like <laughs> Like, the, you know, I, when I was in school, it was a problem, you know, students, certainly when I was there, but I think it's, I think it's perpetuated. It, you know, kid, kids think it's all about the equipment. They really do. They think it's all about the stuff. And you read American Cinematographer Magazine, you see these lighting diagrams, you're like, oh my God, if I had 18 Ks, my stuff would be better. And you start to like associate equipment and, and expensive equipment with, with success. And you know, and I used to think that just, you know, that's kind of what the world, at least the world of American cinema tells, tells kids, unfortunately, I think. And as I've gotten older and worked with more experienced filmmakers, it's, that couldn't be more wrong. You know, it's like, it, it is not about the equipment. It is about the ideas as far as I'm concerned. And, and it's about the, you know, the elegant use of the things that are available to you, you know, and making sure that the, that the resources that you've made available to yourself 
can support the film that you're trying to make and, you know, making choice, strategic choices around that, uh, you know, in terms of the application of technique anyway, and like what I, you know, what I do, I spent probably the first 15 years of my, my, my career learning how to apply technique, learning from cinematographers. You know, I was a gaffer for many years. I was an electrician and, and, uh, you know, I watched many cinematographers solve kind of the same problems over and over again and they have this piece of equipment okay so i'm in this situation i'm going to apply this this technique with this piece of equipment with this exposure with this color management blah 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 and i'll get this result and you know you do that long enough and you watch people work and you sort of see how people solve those problems and it you know it builds your own kind of quiver for how you're going to solve those problems um now that that stuff is kind of more reflexive in my life and i you know i i have a a library of technical solutions in my head in terms of how I'm going to address certain things that, that I'm confronted with. I don't really think about it anymore. And I, I, you know, so I, like, I'm not excited about lighting. I don't get off on it. I'm not interested. You know, it's not like, Oh, great. What do I get to do? It's like, Oh fuck. Now I have to, okay. I got to put light on the actor's face. You know, it's like, uh, <laughs> you know, it's like, it's not, it's not the thing that interests me about cinema. Really. Yeah. It's like the thing that interests me about cinema is, is telling a story and figuring out the most elegant or interesting way to, to approach that given project with that director, you know, and then you apply the technique as needed. I think it's so interesting. And I wonder if you reflect on, because you you are, you work with, I don't know, it's probably not fair to, to use this word, but I, by comparison, I'm, I'll try it. Austere filmmakers like Fincher and Michael Mann, you've got Ferrari coming up. Uh, and you also, you know, you were on the crew for uh, Ant-Man, right? So you've got yeah. Marvel Marvel in your uh, on your belt. I'm, I'm curious how, because everything we read about behind the scenes production of these huge Marvel movies is, oh my God, look at the whiz bang, te- you know, tech that they've put in place to make the visual effects really shine. And I'm curious how you reflect on how that experience compares to, to working uh, in in more sort of intimate productions that have, you know, the the same sort of reputational weight, you know, or if not more, uh, as those productions with you know that come out in, as big blockbusters. Well, you know, look, I don't fault blockbuster visual effects driven films for using visual effects to tell their stories. You know, if you're going to take somebody to space or someone's going to be flying around in a spandex suit, you know, you have to apply the technique that's appropriate for that. I'm certainly not going to stand on the soapbox and say that whatever I'm doing is better or more important than, than that, or, 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 you know, what have you. It's like, I think not to suggest that I wouldn't do it again, or I wouldn't, you know, I'm not interested in those kinds of movies, but there is, a, there's an element of the kind of cookie cutter process of like, okay, now this person isn't standing on the front of that green screen. We have to put a platform for them because they have to look down at the monster that's over here. That's actually a tennis ball. And you sort of like, it ends up becoming very much a, a kind of paint by numbers application of technique that is just not that interesting to me. Um, fundamentally, you know, it's like, there's, there's all sorts of things that we have to do to solve those problems. And they're, and they're challenging and, and can be interesting, but you're, uh, you know, and most of the time, and I don't want to overgeneralize, obviously, because I think some of those movies can be really enjoyable and, and fun for the audience and also for the filmmakers. But for me, it's sort of like I, I need more from more than that in my life. But, you know, my my time in those on those types of projects and my time, you know, on 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 really big productions has informed all sorts of sort of automatic skills that are really that, that have helped me enormously, especially with David Fincher. You know, it's like you know, when, when, when David and I do a movie together, there is no visual effects supervisor, you know, he and I are doing it and we're making those decisions. And, you know, it's, if, if I hadn't had that kind of experience over the years of, of learning how compositors work and how, you know, when LIDAR is appropriate and when, uh, you know, when you can use photogrammetry and all these different visual effects techniques, you know, I, um, I, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't have that skill. So it's, you know, it's like every, every, every experience you have contributes to your own your own working practice. And, and I, you know, I love, I love that, uh, part of the movie business, you know, but I, I would never claim that like one thing is better or worse than the other or whatever, you know, it's like you go through life and you, and you accumulate experiences. Well, and I, I get, I totally get that. I'm just sort of hanging on your, your comment about thinking that the technology is the answer, right? That the, the improved gear is the answer. And yeah. because so much weight is put on the, you know, now the, the latest things, probably not even the latest thing anymore, talking about shooting in the volume, right? For all these Disney shows. Right. And, and that feels like, uh, you know, sometimes we lose the thread of does the volume tell the story? 
And the answer is objectively no. And, uh, you know, it's it's it, I I I feel that when I certainly when I look at the films you've worked on uh, and, you know, we're huge fans of of the killer and and of you know mank and of the uh, all of these these projects that feel even though they're big stories they feel so intimate there and and i feel like i'm present and i've never really the volume doesn't make me feel present sitting by the fire with with you know boba fett or whatever and i still love those projects like i'm a nerd sure. too right i'm not a savage well so. yeah i mean look it's the problem with that stuff is the technology ends up sucking up all the air in the room you know, and and by the way, the the volume's not a new idea. You know, Hitchcock was doing it to catch a thief, right? You right, know, right. like it's rear projection. You know, cinema is about foreground against background always. You know, it's we're it's unless you're making a three D movie, you're you're telling a story. You're you know you're taking three a three dimensional environment. You're compressing it into two dimensions, and you're telling the audience where to look. And you know whether it's a green screen or a rear projection screen or a painted backdrop or an LED screen. It's ostensibly the same idea, you know, and look, I see volume work all the time that I think looks like Lassie. It's just not good, you know, <laughs> and I'm sure it's probably because everyone was talking about uh, what the background is and they weren't thinking about what's in the foreground and what you have to think about in the movie business most of the time is what's in the foreground, right. you know, <laughs> right. I mean, that's like, so, so I find it. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. I just. You know, you, you only have so much mental bandwidth on on a on a on a given day, and and uh, and it's really hard to make movies, you know. And I think when I watch the directors that I that I really admire, they're focused on the right things, you know. Whether or not you like their movies, you know, David Fincher, Michael Mann, Ridley Scott, you know, these sort of older filmmakers that I've worked with, they're interested in what they need the audience to look at. They're not distracted by all the other stuff. You know, and I think filmmakers today really they they get kind of hyper focused on the wrong things. Oftentimes, you know, they're like, "Oh, well, we should use the volume because we're supposed to be." And it's like, "Well, are you sure?" You know. So yeah, I mean, look, it's you know, sometimes I see you know for foreign films, or I was you know at the Cameron Mosh Film Festival last week, and I I saw some movies that were made with very little money that are incredibly effective because they use the camera in a in a really elegant and kind of economical way, you know, and, and, and they, they spend the money on the things that are, that are essential. And when stuff can be told in close-ups, you know, it can be told in close-ups. It's like, it's, you know, it's not, I don't know. So yeah, I, Fuck the equipment. Doesn't matter. <laughs> well, and it's not our well, our objective is not to never get you a Marvel job again. So, you know, just, no, 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 it's okay. you're doing yeah. fine. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think you're right. I think there are times where filmmakers get lost in the, all the toys because I mean, and that's, you know, it's kind of a pejorative description of everything that goes on in the film industry because it does create magic. But the idea is like, there is all of this constant evolution in new technologies within the industry to do this new thing and that new thing. And I mean, David Fincher is a perfect example of a director who understands like, there's always these things that you can be doing, but it's understanding like, don't just do it for the sake of doing it, you know, find a way like, does it integrate into the story? Is there a purpose for using that? Otherwise, why use it? You know, we don't need to just do that. Like, going back to seven and the and the commentary talking about using the the bleach bypass process to give the film a different look. But I mean, it's not like that doesn't make sense just to do it on all of the movies like Benjamin Button. Let's do it because it just is a great look. But it's like, well, does it work for the story? Like, you know, finding the right things that make sense for the story. And I think that's that speaks to some of these people that you've uh, talked about. And I think the idea and, you know, you know, talking about specifically like the killer, which is out now that uh, that you worked on uh, with Fincher, just some of the decisions that go into the way that you capture headspace within a character. And I, I found like just thinking about like the technical conversations that the two of you likely had paired with like, how does that tie thematically into the story? And like, where does it make sense? Why, why do, you know, should we use narrow depth of field? Like what, what space are we creating here in the conversations that you have in that film specifically? Like, what are some of the driving decisions that you have to kind of get into uh, Fassbender's character's uh, headspace for that story, which is such an important part of the story? For me, the conversation, at least on this movie, but I, I mean, the, the most interesting conversations are always scene structure and structure of the, the, you know, the overwhelming structure of the movie and how we're going to tell the story. You know, what 
what grammar are we going to utilize? What's the pace? What's the speed? How, you know, what's the integration of sound? I mean, that's, a, you know, it's a funny thing on this movie. It was, you know, we had lots of discussions around, okay, what are the th- things we need the audience to see? And what are the things that they can hear that we don't need to show them? What are the things they can infer off camera? You know, it's like, it's, that to me is much more interesting than what piece of diffusion I'm using or whatever, you know? <laughs> um, I, I, I think, you know, what David really understands is that, you know, 90% of the equipment that cinematographers use is schedule driven. You know, so for example, you know, you might go into a location and say, wow, this looks really great in the morning. Cause look at all that, you know, all that, all that light. And then, um, you know, you get back to production meeting. It's like, oh, we, we can't work till the afternoon. It's like, okay, now I need six condors, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? And then people post fix- pictures on Instagram, like, look at all my condors. It's like, well, that's, that's a scheduling problem. <laughs> you know, so, so David is, is looking at what I'm doing and what I need to do and what's important to us. And he's thinking about how, how his decisions impact my life. Right. Mm-hmm. But I mean, you know, the kind of creative stylistic conversations that we're having around that movie in particular was, was a, was a conversation about, subjectivity and objectivity and you know, when we put the audience inside Michael's brain and when we're watching him and, and how does the camera behave when we're watching him? You know, I believe that depending on how close to the eye line you put the camera, it has an enormous effect on how connected the audience is to the character. You know, so if you're in a profile, you're in kind of a three quarter frontal and they're looking off screen, you're, you're inherently in a very observational, um, you know, objective position. And then the closer you get the camera to the eye line and the more, down the lens, you know, until, until they're looking at the lens, that is, you know, that is entirely subjective. The application of how much nuance you want to put there, that affects the character and it affects the audience's perception of that character and the, and the, and the character's interaction with the audience. Uh, and that was something that we were really interested in exploring, you know, it was like, okay, we we're, we're never going to look at anything over his shoulder, really, you know, unless we want to see something at the exact same time that he sees it as a passerby, you know, and it's, you know, it's very Hitchcock kind of, you know, it's like he looks off screen and we're then the cameras between his, you know, between his ears looking and we show the audience what he's seeing. And, you know, we pan around, we're in Paris, we pan around, we see something, we cut back to him reacting. You know, it's a very, it's, it's simple structure, but it's, but depending on how close to the island we get it, it you know, is, is affects, you know, how kind of voyeuristic the audience feels in that situation. And that was something that we, you know, we talked about and we're curious about. Two points. The the first is specifically on that. I, I hearing you talk about it, I can only reflect on that opening sequence when we have had such a journey through his his experience in that room, and we're looking down the barrel of that particular weapon, and then the thing happens, and we're far away from him in the room, kind of at the edge of the room, when he has his awakening that he just had a he just screwed up. And that is such a, like, I now feel like I'm sitting in judgment of him for the first time in that room as an audience member and realize the movie as a result has just changed. And I think it is uh, just, it it is a perfect movie in, or a perfect moment in that movie. I just, I really celebrate it. The the piece I want to pivot to gets away for a little bit from the the objectivity, subjectivity uh, point. On, on the film, when I think about it, and we've talked about the girl with the dragon tattoo uh, a whole bunch uh, on this movie. We've talked about all the different versions of it. And one of the things that I think the movie does so well is it makes research on a computer like pornography. It's like it makes it sexy and exciting. The killer sets out. I, I don't know if there if, if there was an intention to do this, maybe, but it definitely feels like going down that road for air travel and logistics. Like it is such a a workaday experience of trying to get from location to location by vehicle. And I wonder how you talked about presenting what could be a pretty banal experience and making it a feature level uh, journey for the audience. You know, we joked a little bit at you know, one point where I said to David, I said, God, this is just a movie about a guy sitting in a car looking at stuff, you know? <laughs> yeah. But I think it it speaks to Michael's character. The killer is a character who has he he's he's a chess player. He's always you know he's he likes to be three four moves ahead of everything. You know he says that in the movie. He's like, look, you know, it's anticipate, don't improvise. And so you know when he's writing that that empty uh, FedEx envelope in the beginning, and he sends it to New Orleans, and you know the audience is like, what is this? 
And then you realize, oh, that's how he's gained entrance. You know, he's thinking three, four moves ahead. Okay, I have to go here. There's a door. I have to figure out how to get in. And we're constantly trying to show him anticipating until he can't anymore, you know. And then you know, when the when he's in a situation of improvise uh, of, of improvisation and he can't, he's on his back heels, the camera is kind of loose and, and confused and, and, and out of place, you know, and then the opposite happens when he's, when he's, uh, you know, in control, you know, but it's, it is very much okay. A to B to B to C to C, you know, he's, he is, he's connecting the dots constantly. And, and we're, you know, hopefully you see him thinking about it consciously about what, you know, we're sort of setting the stage, uh, and then, and then watching him go through it. Uh, you know, same thing when he's following the brood and he goes to the, to the strip club and he watches them go inside. And now he knows that they're going to be gone for a bit and they're going to come back. So he's going to go back and hide, or, you know, he, he's driving, he's following Leo in the taxi and he's, he's in the car. And then suddenly he's in a taxi and the audience, hopefully we want the audience to be like, hold on, he was just in his car. Why is he in the taxi? And then he gets in Leo's taxi, he drives away. And then after he, sh- he shoots him, spoiler alert, you know, he walks to his Jeep and you realize, oh, he's, he's had this plan the whole time. He's left his car there, you know? So it's like a constantly, th- you know, constant thing in his life of like, okay, this is how I'll deal with this. I'll go do that. And it's, you know, it's almost, it's janitorial for him in a way. So, yeah, I mean, I think you're right. It, I mean, it's not, it's not a planes, trains and audible thing, but he's, you know, he's using the tools at his disposal. He's like, okay, well, I got to rent a car now. It's also why watching this movie closely, seeing it like it makes rewatchability really exciting because there's something new on every watch. Like it took me the second watch to realize that was his Jeep <laughs> after right. the, yeah, the right. Leo sequence. I was like, I, I just thought he was walking down a neighborhood street. But you totally get that. And the, and and mailing the FedEx envelope to himself. That's a that's a second or third time note, you know, which is I, I think makes the movie really, really smart. Thank you. Now you have coming out very shortly, uh, Michael Mann's Ferrari uh, that you worked on, which is, uh, you know, another biopic you did make with uh, with Fincher already transitioning to like that type of story. I mean, you're obviously having similar sorts of conversations. It's all about the story. It's all about what how are we going to tell this story? But do you find a different angle that everybody, including you, are approaching when it comes to one of these stories that is based on you know actual events and characters? There, there's look. There's always that balance between historical accuracy and effective drama in cinema, but there's there's also the reality that there is no such thing as a true objective documentary. You know, the camera by nature is a subjective tool. It, you know, it's it's an exclusionary tool. It, you know, it, it it restricts your vision. You know, in the case of Michael, anyway, he's he's looking at the dramatic portions of Enzo's life, and and the, and you know, it, this film is a very quite literally just, you know, it's not really a biopic. It's, it's three months of his life and you're supposed to kind of come in and hopefully you don't know anything about Enzo Ferrari, but you immediately kind of get a sense for who this person is, that this, this person is important in their community, that they have uh, political influence, that they have social influence, that they're, you know, he's an employer, but he's also obsessive and, you know, and a bit mad and, and, and very focused on, on, on ambition and success, you know, and it's sort of like the movie, I think is, is more kind of a, a, a portrait about those characteristics than it is about, okay, now you're going to sit down for two and a half hours and learn about the life of Enzo Ferrari. You know, it's the, that those movies exist already. Um, and I don't think that's really what Mike was going for. I think he's like, look, here's, here's a really, really interesting kind of maelstrom of dramatic stuff that's happening in one person's life that, that, that tells a story about, you know, really how this brand came to be and why it's why it's so sort of chiseled in 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 in, hu- in modern human history as, as being important it's because of this kind of very strong personality behind it all um you know but it's yeah i mean i you know you, i think in the case of like historical ac- historical accuracy and making sure that we maintain the integrity of of something that a lot of people really care about you know we're we're paying enormous attention to that obvi- obviously in the scope of a uh, film dealing with a lot of uh, cars, car racing and stuff like that, uh, you know, do you how, I mean, we're there's obviously I mean, I've I, we've only seen the trailer. It's it's, um, you know, several weeks uh, or over a month before the film is going to be released. It seems like some of the accidents and stuff, there's some digital creations and stuff like that. But in the scope of crafting complexities with car races and stuff like that in the scope of what you're doing, like, do you find 
like what sort of tools, like how do you end up integrating camera into decisions that you're making with that? Like um, we've all seen plenty of car racing films. Like is the camera going to be in the car with the person uh, uh, kind of attached to the car floating, you know, behind the car, like decisions in figuring out how you're going to put that sort of thing together in, in new and in- interesting ways. It was all the volume, wasn't it? It was just all the volume. <laughs> yeah. It's impl- yeah. None of it's real. No. <laughs> just right. Well, you know, look, first of all, it's all re- real. Um, re- you know, oh, okay. uh, at least the car, you know, there is no green screen. There's no volume. There's no car process. There's cars. We shot the cars on the roads in Northern Italy. We're not in Atlanta, faking Atlanta for Italy. You know, we're not doing any of that. But automotive racing has a long history in broadcast and, and visual storytelling. You know, you go back to the early days, and Michael had a lot of this stuff. You know, he had amazing historical records, uh, you know, uh, newsreel footage, you know, kinescope recordings of, you know, 16 millimeter races in the, in the, um, in the early 50s. He had, um, you know, uh, newsreel footage of, of crashes, there, you know, lots of stuff. We had all that to pull from. Uh, and what's interesting when you really dig into it is you watch the, the kind of structure of, of visual storytelling when it comes to sports evolve. You know, now when you watch Formula One, um, you have a very effective camera methodology in terms of telling the audience who's in, who's in front, where the overtakes are. You know, they, they have done... There's enough history in terms of how these stories are told that 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 the storytellers learn how to how to tell those stories to 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 illustrate a very specific thing. In the case of Formula One, who's in who's in the lead, you know, but that's you know, that, that's a very singular sort of, you know, um, distilled down goal of a, of a visual storyteller. That's not necessarily in line with what we were trying to do with Ferrari. You know, the, the cars are an allegory for for the character in a way, you know, I mean, who's winning, who's in, in front, who's in the lead is important from a plot standpoint, but thematically it's sort of less important. What I think Michael really wanted to illustrate was, look, these were, these were death machines. You know, these, this is an incredibly dangerous occupation with a high mortality rate. And these are people that are willing to risk it all for greatness. And and how do we put the audience in that environment to, so that they really understand the gravity of the decision making that goes into someone getting behind the wheel and saying, yeah, I'm going to go and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to break later and I'm going to win, you know? And, and I think that's, you know, ultimately led to all those decisions of, okay, we're going to, we're going to handhold the camera and we're going to, you know, we want the audience to feel like they, they smell, smell gasoline. We want them to feel like they're getting grit in their face. And yes, the camera's going to shake. We're not going to use all the kind of, Go to tools that have been designed to tell that very specific, but in one simple story of this person passes here, now this person is in front, now these people are behind, and now they're going to react. Now they look, you know, the sort of scene structure stuff that we're also used to because we watch chase movies and race movies and airplane movies and all that, you know, all that kind of similar, you know, uh, motion picture grammar storytelling that, that. Um, you know, was important to the story, but also, you know, Mike was trying to trying to have a philosophical conversation with the audience as well. I think um, does that answer your question? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it totally does. But at the same time, like you talk about, kind of your history as uh, as a nerd and a cinephile and somebody who gets jazzed about movies, and you talk about this about this movie in a in a, a pretty sober and introspective way. And I'm just curious. You're shooting a movie that is incredibly exhilarating about a legendary racing brand. Did you like what excited you about capturing this film? I I just I'm like on your behalf. My skin is like <laughs> tingling just thinking about it. Watching this trailer is exhilarating. Well, you know, it's a funny thing because I yeah, I mean, I love motorsport. I, I love I, I love the combination. I mean, it does. It speaks to my geekness. And my appreciation of art and design, you know, and 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 competition, you know, it's it's kind of this this be- beautiful combination of engineering and athleticism. But you know, it's it's a funny thing because I, you know, of course, you know, the fourteen year old boy in me is is very attracted to the cars. And uh, you know, Michael said in the beginning, he said, "Look, we're not going to fetishize the cars. 
They do it. They do it on, you know, the, you put a Ferrari in front of the camera. It's, it's enough. It's already done. It's yeah. enough. You know, right? we don't need to do it. The 14 year old boy that. says not even a little bit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. Um, and it's very tempting, you know, it's very tempting to, you know, put this low camera in and sweep across and see all the reflections and you watch all the nuance and beauty and all the curvature. And I mean, they're sexy yeah. machines, right? By design. By yeah. design. But they're also, uh, and, and it's an important distinction. They're, they're, tools that are instruments of success or failure for these characters you know you look at how these these machines were used they were somewhat disposable you know i mean they're incredibly valuable now but at the time look this was this was a machine that they built to win a race and the next year they built another one and they learned what they you know they learned how they failed on the previous one and they put that one in the garage They're like okay the wheelbase has to be a little wider and this has to be a little you know now these kind of symbols of of, of design greatness. But, you know, it, when it comes down to it, you know, he cared about how they looked, but those decisions primarily were coming out of, out of how do I, how do I win the race? You know, and it's a very pure thing. And now everyone is sort of distracted and it, and I think it does speak to kind of the, you know, the obsession around equipment and this idea that like, Oh, well we have, no, it's like you have to distill it down into the thing that's ultimately the most important. And then, you know, and trust that it'll happen. And that's kind of the lesson I learned from, from Ferrari is like, like he had one goal for, you know, if, if the movie, if the cars were beautiful, but they didn't win, it made, it made no difference to him. He didn't, you know, he was not, it's like, well, they're beautiful. You know, that was, that never came out of his mouth. It was like, did you win or lose? And, um, you know, and I think that, so, so we, you know, we deliberately didn't beautify the cars we weren't out there trying to shoot you know it's it's not fast and furious it's not like look at this mustang you know it's like no it's about the guys driving it and what they're what they're dealing with and and that's you know hopefully what the audience gets out of it cut to today i mean ferrari's still losing to an energy drink <laughs> i know and it's very depressing it's very it's depressing. So depressing every sunday <laughs> oh, every sunday i just i just i i pray that max verstappen's gonna hit hit some pothole or something you know? oh <laughs> we weld the manhole covers just too soon that's all I'm saying. it's totally uh, yeah yeah <laughs> oh well you know well good for him good for him yeah good for him well, this, I think, is a, a perfect spot to transition uh, and start talking about the reason that we're here, uh, looking at Roman Polanski's fantastic film, Chinatown. Los Angeles, 1937. There are lots of guys like J.J. Gittes. They're easy to find, if you want to find them. Mr. Gittes, have we ever met... Well, no. Never? Never. Since you agree with me that we've never met before, you must also agree with me that I've never hired you to do anything, certainly not spy on my husband. I don't get tough with anyone, Mr. Giddies. My lawyer does. You do your job. And sometimes you find the answers to questions that should never be asked. Or you find out what happens to people who ask them. All in the night, kitty cat. You get tough. You get tender. You get close to each other. Maybe you even get close to the truth. Jack Nicholson and Faye Dunaway in a Robert Evans production of a Roman Polanski film, Chinatown. So, Eric, this was one of your uh, picks. You had a, a string of fantastic films that you uh, threw out as options. And this is the one we had not talked about. So here we are talking about Chinatown, which for some reason we haven't even gotten around to. I don't know why we haven't talked about this on the show before, Pete. It's probably my fault. Eric, what is it about this film that uh, stands out to you that makes it like one of those greats that is like, this is why I want to talk about this movie? It's probably the first movie I saw where I became really aware of elegance in camera direction, deliberate choices that lead to that that lead to visual storytelling. You know, you watch the first act of that movie. There's very little dialogue. You know, Evelyn Mulray or who he thinks is Evelyn Mulray comes into his office. She says, oh, my husband's cheating on me. Will you look into it? It's, you know, the scenes all of three eighths of a page long. And uh, I think. I, I, it's been a while, but yeah, you know, and then he goes to the public hearing and he, and he watches him and we're just watching him watch Hollis Mulray up there, you know, acting pretty, 
defiantly, look, I'm not going to build the dam, man. I'm not doing it. And then you cut back and he's like, oh, this is interesting. What's going on? And then he, you know, then he falls into the, right. He goes to the LA river and he watches and you're sort of, you know, the audience is, is slowly accumulating information about this thing. They're not saying anything about this guy. We're just watching him. Right. Watching a detective do his work. Right. Yeah. There's this spectacular shot, you know, where the car is, is, is pulling in and we're like, suddenly we're in the desert or we're in, you know, we're in the wash of the LA river, the dry LA river, which tells us, okay, there's a drought. There's no water. Here's a bridge. There should be water there. That's a river. You know, for people who are not from Los Angeles, they they don't they they're probably not familiar with this concept. You know, the dry riverbed that we're all so used to. Those of us that live in Los Angeles, you know, and that you know the car pulls in and stops, and the camera keeps panning and lands on on Jack Nicholson's face. I mean, that is cinema. You know, and it's very deliberate cinema. It's someone. You know, this is Polanski saying, "Okay, this is important, and now I'm going to take you to the person that's seeing it." Now he's going to put the, the binoculars up. Now I'm going to show you what he's looking at. You know, you know, that's Hitchcock better than Hitchcock ever did it. You know, I mean, that is so kind of design and specific and elegant. And so that's, you know, that's it's it's choices like that that make me just completely adore that movie and study it. You know, it's like it's extraordinary as far as I'm concerned. It's like because the story is not that complex, really, uh, at least initially. And then it unravels. But, you know, you sort of get the pieces periodically through the screenplay and you start to put it together visually. It, it is interesting to me, just as an aside, not to belabor this point too much, that you would pick this movie that so adeptly addresses the question of subjectivity and objectivity through Jake Giddies after just coming off of The Killer, which I feels like in terms of a character study, very similar approach to character, especially in the first part of the film, as you said. It's fascinating. But you're also right. Like, it's a non-complex movie that only becomes complex because of the injection of humanity into it. Once we realize that it's a discussion of exploitation of natural resources that causes the worst of humanity to come out, that Jake has no idea that he's coming walking into this, is that's one of the things that make this makes this movie interesting to me, is that it is this bloom and onion of of human foible that Polanski is able to capture in a way that I'd never seen before. Yeah, he almost stumbles into it. You know, it's like Jake is, you know, he's he's just trying to make a living. You know, that whole thing in that scene in the in the barbershop, he's like, I'm making honest living, pal. You know, he's not doing it's not, there's no altruistic bone in Jake in Jake's care. You know, he's not like, oh, let me, I'm going to go do this pro bono because it's going to be good for the citizens of Los Angeles. You know, he sort of stumbles upon this. He's like, hold on. There's some real sinister shit going on here. And but, you know, it's sort of like from his character standpoint, he's like, I got I I, uh, I got made a fool of and I don't like that. I'm the guy that makes a fool of everybody else, you know, again, human, right? Human foible. And so his motivation, you know, yeah, I mean, you don't have, you know, the kind of classic American version of that, that movie is the is the hero discovers that the you know, that, that the citizens of Los Angeles are being wronged and I'm going to save them. And, it, you know, it's very you know, th this movie has an added, obviously, an, a, 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 an added layer of complexity, but it's, um, but th it's sort of the, the, the fact that it's told in kind of a, a almost minimalist way, you know, it's not, it's not Bertolucci, you know, we're not sitting back there on one shot, you know, he's, he's, it's montage, he's like taking you here, and he shows you what he sees, and you see, the, you know, but you do have this, these moments of humanity, you know, the, the camera becomes handheld, he's down on the beach, and all of a sudden we're handheld and we don't care, you know, we're in the bathroom and she's cutting his nose and you have this kind of delicate, delicate music and she's cleaning his, uh, he's, she's cleaning his wound and it's very intimate and, you know, it, it doesn't feel like it's grand in scope, but it, you know, it's amazing to me how he's able to transition back and forth from that, that language to the very structured, rigid classical language without the audience getting jarred, you know, I mean, that, that to me is so difficult to accomplish. And he does it so effortlessly in this movie. And the choices are so kind of clever and, and timely, you know, it's, it's extraordinary. Yeah, it really just struck me with, uh, on this viewing of just the way that the, the story flows so, so smoothly from those initial uh, the initial investigation as you're kind of following Giddy's as he's doing the investigation, um, brilliant, like jumps through time too. as we're kind of watching as he's following Hollis. And you see the just the, the way that we kind of very easily understand, OK, he's been following him for well, like over 24 hours or however long it is, because we're seeing the change in the sun. And, and finally, the little trick with the clock, the watches, um, but also just how effortlessly he kind of moves through the story and i mean it's a detective story robert town i think very 
perfectly crafted the the way that this detective story moves, but um, also just the way that Polanski directs it, because you're really we start buying into, oh, I'm starting to piece this together. I'm seeing that these threads of this detective mystery of something going on in the water, and that led to this whole thing without really, I mean, I find myself going back to the first time where I had no clue that really a lot of what was happening all boiled down to this this family dynamic situation that was going on with Evelyn, her father, her daughter slash sister, and uh, and how Hollis was tied into all of, all, of, all of this ties together in such a fascinating way by the time we get to the end, where it's really like these two story threads that come together, but you're just the way that Polanski and town crafted the script, it just, I find it to be um, a real surprise because as you said, it's effortless in how we're moving through it. Like you just don't even realize that you're getting all of these pieces until you kind of hit those, that last moment in Chinatown. Yeah, for sure. I mean, well, you know, look, I, I love screenwriters, but there are times I think when screenwriters, you know, screenwriters love to write dialogue. You know, they love to write clever dialogue. And, and, you know, they're telling the story in their head and they're thinking about the structure and, and, you, you know, this movie uses dialogue so sparingly. And so, it, you know, it's, it's, things are only said when they have to be said. And then they are, they are shown when they can be shown better than if they were said, you know? So, um, and, and I think that, that really speaks to Robert Town's brilliance is he knows, he understands the, the, the cinema medium and and he there's enough trust between him and Polanski that okay I don't need to have Jake describe what he's doing you know it's like my my least favorite thing about modern cinema is half half exposition seems to be people standing in front of computer screens describing what's on the computer screen to the audience because it's you know it's like sort of CSI thing where everyone's like oh he's going down the hallway oh look he's turning to the right wait what's down the right and then they show the map you know it's like it's so lazy you know that there's none of that in this movie this movie is using the telephone booth when it's appropriate. It's using the point of view. He's, you know, he's, he's setting things up. He's, you know, he's, he's asking the audience questions. You're going down. He's like, why is this culvert? Okay. Now this water comes out. It's like that, that question doesn't get answered for like an hour in the movie, but he tees it up for you, you know? And I, you know, that's, I think that that's just clearly Robert Town understanding cinema, you know? And character dynamics as well. I mean, you're getting the same thing like we're getting such little bits of of Guinness and his relationship with all of the people that he knew from the force back when he was working with them right it's never spelled out but every time he's with them like and going back to that culvert is a perfect example when he brings them all down there to show them like this is where i mean obviously it's not happening now because we're not here in the middle of the night but like the first thing that we get in that scene is the one uh who's in the the officer blues he just kind of scoffs at him he's like <laughs> like just completely right. doesn't buy into any of this and that's all we get from that guy as a character what are you talking about we're in a drought man yeah it's like what, what are you, they're not dumping water there's no water yeah, it's just it's such a it's it's such brevity and simplicity in the way that town crafts those relationships. So we don't need any of that spelled out. Like we get it all through the dynamics of how those characters are all um, interacting. Right. Yeah. No. Exactly. And and you know I think it also it it makes the the payoff and and the the real dramatic um, moments in the in the movie not exploitive. You know, I, I think when she reveals to him what's really going on in the family dynamic and what's really going on with with Noah Cross and, you know, this kind of and he's it's it, because the movie has been so kind of elegantly presented to you, you forgive the fact that, OK, this is this is this is a little bit more than I expected. You know, I thought I was just watching watching this gumshoe kind of detective story, you know. Like, oh, my God, this is so much more complicated than, than what's going on, you know. And, and then ultimately, you know, of course, the fact that he tries to do the right thing and totally fails, you know. Um, I mean, it's like the, it's like the, the, he's super successful when he's serving himself. And then the second he tries to do the right thing for somebody else, he blows it. And, you know, it's like it's great. It's like so not not expected. Yeah, it's it's interesting to talk about it in that light, because this is a movie. And it's one of the things that I think we like to talk about is how much does the writer and, and, and you know, and director really. But the writer, in the case of some of the things we're talking about, trust the audience. 
and and to the extent that they're able to let go of things that we just really need the audience to understand did they really turn right at the end of that corner on that computer computer screen versus can we just trust that they get it because they're watching it and 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 I, I think that's something that this movie does in a way that allows me as an audience member at the end of the movie, to your point, not suddenly be jarred into the space of I'm watching a telenovela, right? They just revealed something to me that's so off the rocker that there's no way I can believe it. I absolutely believe it uh, because they've trusted me all along to understand that this isn't a movie about a gumshoe. This is a movie getting about a guy who accidentally finds himself in the most messed up family that that exists in Los Angeles at the time. Like, it's it's just a human failure. When when I talk to students now, and sometimes I go to film schools, you know, there's a there's a, a wide range of how people, what people think directing is. You know, a lot of people believe, I find, that directing is eliciting a, a performance out of somebody. That it's about bringing a character to a place so that you can get a certain dramatic response and working with an actor to get... And I, you know, I, uh, there's there's obviously truth to that but to me directing is far more nuanced than that that idea you know it's it's the it is the the execution of cinema as a as a tool to transport the audience through you know to take to take the audience through a story you know this is the 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 use of the camera to tell the story in this film is not john alonzo you know that's clear because the blocking decisions have been have been designed around around a very specific set of set of information that you need people to understand. You know, that's clearly Polanski and, and, and Robert town, you know, understanding, okay, we need you to see this. Now this is going to happen here, but it's also, he's making on the fly decisions in terms of how he has to cover information. You know, you, you can tell it's not like this hasn't been, the whole movie wasn't storyboarded either. You know, he's, he's allowing the kind of the, the, the film to flow a little bit when it has to. And then he's, you know, he, he pulls the reins back when he's like, I don't know, this is, I just need you to see the following things. Uh, you know, like the good example I think is, is the, uh, the scene when he goes to meet, meet Robert, uh, uh, when he goes to meet Noah Cross for lunch and he sits down and, and Jack Nicholson stands up and he says, I'm out of here. You know, this is, this is not, this is not what I signed up for. And he walks away and then Noah Cross stands up. I guarantee you that that scene was rehearsed. You know, they're like, okay. And, Jack says, you know, I, I, I need to stand here. This I got to step away. And then Houston stands up. He's like, okay, well then, you know, they, they rehearsed that scene and they, I, I'm sure they blocked that on the day. You know, it's not like Roman was in there. He's like, okay, then he stands into a medium shot and then Noah's down here. You know, that's not how that works. So he's, you know, he's kind of, he's working out the movie as he needs to w- with, with respect to what's been structured, you know, um, dramatically in each of those scenes. And it, it, I mean, I just don't, I don't know that that's, like I feel like nowadays, you know, so much of so much of filmmaking, unfortunately, and I think it, it has to do with how easy it is, is we point the camera at people saying stuff. You know, we point the camera, people say the important stuff. We point the camera, the other person, they listen. We point the camera when they say more interesting stuff. The other person responds. End of scene. You know, the, this movie is is antithetical to that entire concept. You know, and and I think it's it should be studied more as a kind of like look this is look what look what you can do you know i just don't see movies like this very much anymore i absolutely agree with that and that's i i get so excited watching some of these films where clearly it has a vision and just simple moments where it's it's not just as you said a, an actor saying something cut to another actor but it's like okay what if we have all of the actors in a shot and what if we have how if they're moving and interacting with one another and how can the camera also move like this it's an entire dance and figuring out how these different elements can can work to achieve things and there's a point in get his office where he's talking to his his partners and the way that he comes up toward the front to the camera so it's like he's in a close shot and it's perfectly crisp and just but then how he also starts moving back to the other characters like you're allowing the story to actually do something else and that is something that i think you're right i think there is this ease in i don't want to just blame it on digital filmmaking but I, I just think it's an ease in the ability to just put stuff down as quick as possible now where people aren't necessarily taking the time to really conceptualize well how can i 
how can we map this entire conversation out in an interesting way where characters are moving, you know, the camera can be moving and it, it creates this different energy that I, I think, I, I don't know, I find that's one of those things that when I'm watching a filmmaker who really understands the tools and and how to integrate those things into it, um, I, I get excited by it. And Polanski, certainly, when I look at any number of his films through the 70s and uh, before and after, I just I, I find that he is one of those people who um, enjoys like playing with that. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, there's a, when, when she first comes to the, who we, you know, we ultimately learn is not Evelyn Mulray, but when she first comes to the office mm -hmm. to hire him, that whole story is that, that whole scene is told in two shots with the, with his associates in the background, listening to the conversation, you know, that's not an accident. It's not like, you know, and there's this thing that happens, you know, those cinematographers and camera operators are like, I got to find the best shot. I got to find the best composition. You know, it's like, no, no, no. Like what you include in the frame is is telling a story, and you know he, he's including subtext in there. So he's got he's got these strong, you know, wide wide angle close ups of her in the foreground cutting against Jake in the foreground. But the guys in the background, they're not there because they're a convenient compositional tool. They're they're leaning in and saying, "Okay, what's going on here? Hold on, I have to." So you get you get something else from the story because you're watching their reaction to what she's saying. They're a little bit out of focus. But, you know, it's like nowadays would be like, oh, let's shoot anamorphic, shoot it wide open so that they're super soft because it's the most beautiful thing. And that doesn't serve the story. You know, he's making a very deliberate story driven choice. And I think that that's, you know, everything in that in that film is it's it's story driven. You know, it's not it's not aesthetic driven. You know, he's not he's he's not framing anything that way because he thinks it looks best. It's 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 because it's delivering the information in a, in a in an elegant way to the audience so that they pick, you know either pick up on it directly or they pick up on it subconsciously. It, it's an interesting thing speaking to the use of camera specifically. Like this movie is is often cited as the a film that helps sort of define the neo noir kind of aesthetic standard, right? That is that is used, you know, all over the place, right? And we move into like Confidential and Miller's Crossing, and and you're a guy who did Mank, right? Like when you think about the choice to shoot straight, as you say, what you're putting in the frame, what you choose to to extract from the frame versus choosing to move into a more dramatic angle to convey some sort of a move. How do you rationalize that in the context of moving a story forward? Well, I think you once you make this sort of commitment, you have to carry it forward. This this film is so kind of deliberate in terms of its stylistic use of the camera as a as a directing tool, as a communication tool that he has to maintain it through the entire movie. If, if it became very loose and French new wave and verite in the middle, and then it came back, it would be very jarring. You know what I mean? So I think it speaks more about like, this is how I'm going to tell this story. And when I, when I meet with directors, it's like, no, what's the grammar map? You can reach for poetry, but if the film doesn't really work or it transitions seamlessly from one style to another, that's one thing, but you know, that's really, it's really hard to do. And it's so much about like, okay, I'm going to stick to the style and I'm going to go with it. You know, in Mank, it was like, okay, we're going to, we're going to go for it. And you kind of have to put your head down and just, you know, lead with your shoulder and like, okay, we're, you know, we're going to do this and, and hope it works. Um, and, you know, and it, you never really know, you know, it's hard to make a movie, but I, you know, I think it's like, look, the, the guy with the fedora looking off camera is, is an incredibly effective and storied image, you know, from, you know the, the the 1930s on you know it's like yeah uh, it's so implanted we're already in our wired for those images yeah, yeah you know i mean and it's in comic books you know dick tracy you know it's like it's cool it you know it is the definition of cool you know so uh you know but i think it's like Polanski's lucky here because he's you know he's not really reinventing it but it's it's modernized you know he's in widescreen he's not you know it's like if you imagine if you made casablanca in 235 you know, yeah, right. how cool. Right. Right. Yeah. Shocked. I tell you that there's gambling going on all the way over there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it is such a fantastic film. I, I, I hadn't revisited it in quite some time. So I'm glad that you brought it to the table so that I had a chance to to rewatch it. It's such a great film. So can I get a, a ruling on the two Jakes? 
as in terms of a prologue on the end of this conversation? Where do you stand on the two Jakes? No, I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it either, so I can't speak to it. But. Okay. Well, now you guys both have homework. <laughs> I'll watch it tonight. Yeah. yeah you, <laughs> you know, you know what, Eric, you don't have to hurry. <laughs> I yeah, I always heard mixed things. So it is I've mixed. Kind of held off, but I'm I am curious. It's a mixed bag, but you but it's really interesting. It'd be, it'd be interesting to to see what you think of it, just in terms of the fact that it's a movie that tries to leverage the spirit of Chinatown visually in in a way that doesn't doesn't always work. And it makes it, it makes us it's a Jack Nicholas Jack Nicholson vehicle and it makes him vastly, I think, more of a more of a protagonist than Jake Giddy's ever needed to be. Uh so interesting. Right. Right. That well that's what happens sometimes, right? Like there we are. It's a selfish business, man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hey, I, I don't know if this is something that uh, you know more about than the internets, but having worked very recently with David Fincher, you know, he had actually been in talks with Town and Netflix about doing a prequel TV series about kind of the, the early days when Jake Giddies was starting up his agency. Is this just a, a vicious rumor? Do you know any more about this? Is this something that's actually happening? You know, I've read the same articles, but I don't know, actually. Yeah. David never tells me anything until he's ready to make something, so... Uh... Uh, you know, Keeps so, it close so to his chest. yeah, I, uh, I wish I had some intel there for you. I hope it's true. I think that would be amazing, but I, I don't know. Well, who knows? Maybe your name will be attached to it. That would be that would be fun. Who, who knows what an honor that would be. Huh? Yeah, right. No yeah, kidding. Truly. Sequels and remakes, Andy. Oh, big fan. You, I mean, you already brought up the two Jakes uh, that Jack Nicholson himself directed. This came out in 1990. Uh, I've always heard it wasn't as good. I haven't watched it. Uh, and Eric said he hadn't. You had, though. So, you know. Eh. I had. It's not that great. I'm curious, though. It's, it's, it's piqued a, my curiosity. It's an ego. It's an ego film. Yeah, you should you should yeah. see it. I mean, you should absolutely see it. It's been a long time, uh, but it is it's worth I actually st I started it is the thing I haven't finished. I look at my Amazon because it's on. I think it's on Amazon right now. And uh, I my play bar is about 40 minutes in. I was trying to trying to get through it, but it's gotcha. It's exactly what I remembered, which was a Jack Nicholson ego piece. Did it do very well? Do you do you have any notes? I don't I don't have on that. Uh, but obviously the story's done well enough because uh, David Fincher himself, along with Robert Town, have been in talks uh, with Netflix about doing a prequel TV series about Giddy's starting up his agency. Um, it was in the works as of November 2019. I don't know if the whole thing fell apart with COVID or if Fincher is just too busy doing other things now. It also is a project that has been in discussion about the making of Chinatown, kind of like that one they did of, about the making of The Godfather. This would be based on the nonfiction book, The Big Goodbye, Chinatown in the Last Years of Hollywood. Ben Affleck apparently was writing and directing it. Um, last uh, that this was discussed was August 2020. Again, it may have been something that came up during COVID and kind of disappeared. Who knows? if it will ever get made. Wow. Well, how did this one do at award season? Big movie for awards, right? It, it definitely was. I mean, very popular film. 21 wins with 24 other nominations. I mean, just at the Oscars alone, it was one of the most nominated films of that year. Um, and it, of course, didn't win much. Um, in fact, it, uh, of the 11 nominations... It actually only won one. Uh, Jack Nicholson lost Best Actor to the film Harry and Tonto. Faye Dunaway lost Best Actress to Ellen Burstyn in Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore, which we've talked about here on the show or on the next reel. Cinematography lost to The Towering Inferno, which is interesting. Uh, Best Film Editing also lost to The Towering Inferno. Costume Design lost to The Great Gatsby. Sound Design lost to Earthquake. And then Best Picture, Best Art Direction, Set Decoration, Best uh, Director, and Best Music original dramatic score all lost to the godfather part two the only win for this one was best writing original screenplay rough year for the oscar i mean there's a lot of there are some great movies in there it's a holy cow it's a big yeah it's a very big okay. year absolutely at the national society of film critics awards nicholson won best actor for both this and the last detail and then at the baftas nicholson won best actor polanski won best direction and then dunaway lost best actress to joanne woodward in summer wishes winter dreams it lost best art direction best cinematography and best costume design to the great gatsby best film to lacombe lucien best film editing to uh, the conversation best screenplay uh, town actually won for this in the last detail john houston was nominated for best 
Supporting Actor but lost to John Gilgood in Murder on the Orient Express. And the, it was nominated for the Anthony Asquith Award from Film Music, but lost to Murder on the Orient Express. How did you do at the box office? Well, Polanski had an even $6 million to get this movie made, which is about $38.2 million in today's dollars. The movie opened June 21st, 1974, opposite The Terminal Man, Where the Red Fern Grows, and The Groove Tube. While not landing in the top 10, the movie still did quite well for itself, going on to earn just over $23 million domestically, or almost $148 million in today's dollars. It lands the film with an adjusted profit per finished minute of about $835,000. Well, Eric, um, do you have any place on the on the Internet? Do you have a website or anything where people can go check out what you're up to? Or do, are you busy on any socials? Uh, Instagram. You can follow me on Instagram. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, my first initial last name. So, you know, it requires some typing. A little bit, but uh, it's it's not that many letters. People come on. My goodness. Well, Eric, thank you so much for joining us here today. We really appreciate it. My pleasure, guys. Thanks so much. Nice to see you again. It's been a great conversation. And uh, yeah, so I guess that's it. Thanks, everybody else for tuning in. And uh, we hope that you like the show and certainly hope you like the movie like we do here on Movies We Like. Movies We Like is part of the True Story FM Entertainment Podcast Network. The music is Chonk Clap by Out of Flux. Find the show at truestory.fm and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Threads, and Letterboxd at The Next Reel. And if your podcast app allows ratings and reviews, we certainly appreciate it if you could drop one in there for us. See you next time. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to sport our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee, or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Hemp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films, head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. I love having these wonderful chats on movies we like with all these industry guests talking about some of their favorite movies. So many great conversations on that show about so many great movies. We have so much fun having these conversations, but producing the show week after week does require a lot of work behind the scenes. If you'd like to help support our efforts, one easy way is by using our Originals page when shopping for books and movies that we've covered. Your purchases made through our links give us a small commission at no extra cost to you and allow us to keep having these incredible conversations. The Originals page at thenextreel.com slash originals links to the source material for all the adapted film discussions on The Next Reel's family of podcasts. Purchasing through our links supports the show. It's your one-stop shop for Amazon and Apple links where you can buy your copy of the original source material. Original material for movies we like, movies like Casino Royale. The Silent Partner. Never Let Me Go. Silver Linings Playbook. There Will Be Blood, based on Upton Sinclair's Oil. I believe it's Oil! Oh, yeah. I forgot the exclamation point. <laughs> Plus, by using those links to buy your next read, Apple and Amazon show us a little bit of love, which allows you to support our family of shows with minimal effort. 
thenextreel.com slash originals. It's a great way to support the show and find your next page turner. That's right. Head over to thenextreel.com slash originals to pick out your next read and dig in today. Today. 